So we'll continue our discussions about dynamic games with asymmetric information. So the first uh, topic I want to cover today is uh, signaling games. Okay, it's a very, very important class of very, very important class of games. And the idea is as follows. Those of you who are familiar with communication uh, would recognize this kind of problem. You have a sender who chooses gamma 1 and it observes the random variable t which lies in set capital T. T has some distribution pi. Oh, we are using pi for belief, right? I want an initial distribution. What should I use? Mu? Mu? Have we used mu so far? Uh, sorry? Yeah. I'm looking for a symbol for distribution. Rho? Yeah, rho is fine. <laughs> T is distributed according to some distribution rho, okay, and the sender has to pick a message that lies in the set M, and you have a receiver which takes an action A, which is in the set capital A, and it chooses gamma 2, okay. So, how do you use it in communication? So. You have some real number t, probably a, a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian random variable that an encoder observes and an encoder encodes that information, sends it across a communication channel to the decoder. The decoder looks at the output of the communication channel and then comes up with an estimate of what the uh, encoder's original message was. Right? So the setup is very similar in this particular problem. Well, in communications, you have a slight different. You have an additive noise here, right? Or you have bit flips or something of that sort. If you've taken a course in information theory, you, you would recognize that. But in this case, we are assuming a perfect communication channel, okay? So there is a sender, there is a receiver. The receiver sees only the message, uncorrupted message that was sent by the sender. The sender has some private information T, which is its type, right? And the receiver takes an action A, and based on that, both the sender and receiver receive some award, some, some utility or some cost. So let me say C of S, which is a function of T, M, and A, and then C of R, which is a function of T, M, and A. And typically, of course, the receiver and sender they have different cost functions. So why is this uh, example useful? I mean, of course, we know from communication, the entire theory of communication, that this is widely used in communication. And the encoder's uh, cost and the decoder's cost is the same, which is the probability of error. right? But in this case, we are assuming that they may have different costs. And one prime example is, uh, of this setting is the uh, job market signaling. So the T is your hard workingness. Okay, so how hard working you are. And then this person is a student. So assuming that the student is very hard working, he's going to get a higher degree. So that's most of you, I mean, all of you in the class. Okay, so you'll get a graduate degree and then the receiver is a, is a company which is hiring uh, talent and so they are going to look at your education or educational qualifications and the projects, including the game theory project, and then they will decide your wage, okay, how much money they are going to pay you, hopefully, uh, something strictly positive, okay. So, uh, and so based on that, the company is going to receive some uh, reward, which is the amount of money they pay you versus the amount of value you are creating for the company, so that's the company's uh, um, utility and as far as the sender is concerned of course you're getting your wage uh, which is a reflection of what your innate capabilities are and what kind of degree you actually hold okay so 
So that's a job market signaling. This paper was actually written in 1973 by a, a researcher called Spence. He, he, he's an economist and he got, uh, I think he got a Nobel Prize for this. So you will hear a lot of Nobel Prizes in this class, okay? Game theory is all about Nobel Prizes. Uh, so, so he wrote a paper on this. This is known as job market signaling. But this, this idea has actually uh, emerged in many different areas in economics, including finance and, uh, and uh, auctions and so on. So what's the underlying idea? You have two players. Player one is informed. Player two doesn't know what player one is informed about. Okay, all it sees is an action taken by player one, which is the message, message that the player one transmits to player two. That's what the receiver sees. And then based on that, it has to take an action which should minimize its own uh, expected cost and uh, and the sender is going to try and come up with a message that's going to minimize sender's expected cost assuming that the receiver is going to be rational about his action his or her action okay so this is a, a, a dynamic game of asymmetric information right because this type is not available to receiver who is acting at stage two. So, uh, so any question about the model? Okay. So why is it useful in, uh, in our day-to-day -day activities? Well, signaling games is, uh, is quite useful in biology as well, because if you look at, uh, if you look at a bee, a bee will make some sort of, uh, it will, it will, it will fly in a specific fashion depending upon what information is it has received. So if there is food, the bee is going to revolve or, or is going to fly in a specific fashion so as to signal that information to other bees that are not in the immediate neighborhood of that particular bee. And then all the bees will come uh, closer and they will start having their food, okay? So that's one, uh, one uh, signaling game that uh, occurs in, uh, in biology. And then in engineering uh, or in, in uh, adversarial games, the ad so this could be an adversary. The adversary has certain amount of resources or certain amount of intention of causing harm to your system. And the adversary is going to take certain actions which you can observe. And by observing the action, you need to identify what is it that the adversary wants to do. Okay, uh, And then based on whatever you have estimated, you will take an action Whatever you have estimated about the adversary, you will take an action and both ad the adversary and you will get some sort of payoff. So a lot of places where you see this class of games, uh, it's a dynamic game with asymmetric information. And again, uh, the way receiver is going to form a belief about the message, so probability of T given M, this will be the belief, right? Why Phi 2 of m, that will be uh, phi 2 of t given m equal to, so you can, how do I compute it? This will be probability of t comma m over probability of m. What is probability of t comma m? So that's probability of m given t multiplied by probability of t over probability of m given t probability of t summation over all t or integral over all t depending upon how the t is distributed. So we can write it as pi 2 t given m is equal to gamma 1 m m given t into uh, rho of t over summation gamma 1 m given t rho of t t in capital T. Okay, so that's the belief. So howsoever, the, so the best response of receiver has to be consistent with this belief, right? And based on this belief, player one is going to take an action in order to shape 
the belief of receiver okay so that's the important point in signaling games the goal so you know that the receiver is going to take an action based on this belief right so the goal of the sender is to transform this distribution row into a belief for the receiver so that it is favorable to its own expected cost okay so there are three different kinds of equilibriums that emerge in these classes of games uh, very predominant uh, uh, in signaling games so i want to just give you a definition even though we will not i mean there are technical conditions where one of these equilibrium would appear but i don't want to cover those technical conditions because there are uh, a lot of conditions uh, so uh, so so there is one kind of so let's say equilibrium one that would be separating equilibrium uh, by the way i even though i'm writing it as a discrete variable it can all be continuous uh, variables in uh, on real line or on rn okay so don't really have to restrict yourself to discrete uh, spaces but in uh, so so in separating equilibrium your you have a set disjoint sets empty and the best the nash equilibrium of player 1 is such that given the t uh, player 1 gives the complete uh, weightage to the set empty okay and these are all disjoint sets so so if player 2 looks at the message it exactly knows what the type of player 1 is okay so that's called separating equilibrium why why separating equilibrium because player 2 can figure out can can come up with an exact belief on what the or not a belief actually knows what exactly the type of player 1 is okay so that's separating equilibrium then the second type of equilibrium that appears is called pooling equilibrium okay in which uh, gamma 1 maps the entirety to a single point m or gamma 1 star okay so in some sense the receiver doesn't get any signal whatsoever doesn't know what the type of the player is because all types map to a unique value in the message set okay so that's called pooling equilibrium and of course the third would be uh you know it's called hybrid in economics but i would want to write it as quantization because that's something we are all familiar with in ee department so it's a quantization based so gamma 1 star is a quantization type strategy okay so what would a quantization type strategy look like so you have this is your type space t and everything in this t will map to this one everything here will map to a unique value everything here will map to a unique value and so on okay so you divide the set t into multiple blocks and then each of those block actually maps to a unique value in the message set so that's hybrid that's called hybrid in economics and quantization in ec electrical engineering okay so you can see that kind of uh, behavior in uh, in in these signaling game in fact 
those of you who are familiar with communication you know why we, we I mean there is noise in the channel so we often use quantization in order to make sure that the type can be transmitted or this information can be transmitted reliably with very little probability of error okay so this is something that we are more familiar with but you also see it in uh, in economics in fact uh, as you can see the relationship between what we do in communication which is quantization and what we do in real life so depending upon our abilities we will pick the right set of degrees for ourselves okay so if you want to do research if that's what your type is that's what your innate ability is you would pick phd as your uh, as your final degree if that's not if that's not what you want to do you will pick masters if you are just there to get some degree you will pick undergraduate okay nothing against undergraduates okay i mean uh, you know people pick their degrees according to their uh, their personal types okay the personal skill set that they have so that's quantization because within even even if you look at the set of people who have phd's there are different skills right they are not all of the of the same skills okay so there is some amount of uh, quantization that happens in our uh, in our education um, Okay, but we'll not go into any specific examples here. Uh, I just wanted to introduce this uh, this framework because it's very useful, and I want to emphasize this point again. The whole purpose of signaling game, the whole purpose of sender in this signaling game, is to come up with an appropriate belief for player two. Okay, to to pick his strategy such that the distribution over M is favorable to himself. Okay. Uh, there is another class of signaling games, it is called cheap talk and in cheap talk the cost does not depend on the message. CS and CR are independent. of m okay so the message doesn't really affect the cost why is it called cheap talk because transmitting message is cheap okay it doesn't cost you anything so in cheap talk you always have an equilibrium which is known as blabbering equilibrium in which uh, the pi 2 of t given m is the same as rho of t. So no matter how many messages you exchange, <laughs> you don't get actually any useful information okay, in blabbering equilibrium. So you're all blab blabbering all the time. Okay? No, no useful information exchange happens in this class of games. And these are all examples of dynamic games with asymmetric information, okay? Where the belief forms an integral part of this uh, uh, best response, finding out the best response strategies. Okay, any question about it? Yeah. Is there any cooperation implied by the signaling game? Uh, so you can have cooperation in signaling game if these CS and CR are aligned. So in the case of job market signaling, there is some amount of cooperation. You don't want to be in a job which is not meant for you. Okay, so there is some amount of cooperation involved, but uh, but there has been recent work, for instance, in communication, where the sender's cost function is different from the receiver's cost function. In particular, the sender wants to add a bias to this message so that the receiver is not able to uh, identify what the true message was. Any other question? Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, like typical games, uh, does the sender want to uh, want the receiver to identify style? 
Sorry, I didn't understand your question. So the, the sender sends a message yeah. to shape the belief of the, of the receiver, right? Right. It's, it's intended for the, like for the receiver to identify the type of the sender? or. or well, the it? receiver's cost depends on the type. Okay, so let me give you an example for for the job market signaling. What kind of uh, cost functions you can have? So let's say T equals to M equals to A equals to zero one. Okay, or maybe a uh, zero is not included and your cost is C of S T M comma A equals to A minus M over T, no T over M, what is it? M over T? Oh, I don't have it here. Oh, no, M over T. And C of R, T, M, A equals to A minus T square. So the receiver, which is a company, wants to pay as close to the real type of the person, whereas the sender uh, wants to get as much salary as possible, uh, but uh, the more, the higher number of degrees it has, the more effort he has put in, in training himself, so the cost reduces a little bit because of that. And the higher the type level is, the lower the effort is. So this is kind of the effort variable, and this is the payoff. So this is, oh, sorry. Uh, this is actually utility function, so let me make it a cost function. So this is the payoff, and this is the cost of uh, training himself based on the type. So if a person has very little ability, so A, so the type is very close to zero, he has to really put in a lot of effort in order to completing a degree, right? There are other cases where your T could be multidimensional, okay? And your message would just pick a few of those T's and send that information out, okay? So your T could be T1, T2, T3, and the message would be just T1 and T2. So you will tell the truth, but not the complete truth. Okay? You will hide some amount of information. Uh, so this class of games have also been studied in economics. Uh, the reason why I'm covering these topics is because we never know in which application you will have, you will see these kind of uh, uh, situations arising. Uh, I haven't really seen uh, much papers written on signaling games uh, outside of this stochastic control area, okay, to solve some engineering problem. Okay, any question? No? So let's talk about Markov games. That's the next topic. By the way, in cheap talk game, you can have other form of equilibrium also, but blabbering equilibrium will always be there. Okay, Markov games. So in Markov games, you have a state Okay, so state is xt, u1t is the action set of player one, u2t is action, no, not action set, u1t is action of player one, u2t is action of player two, and wt is some actuation noise. And the information of the first player is the same as information of the second player, which is x1, u11, u21, x2, u12, U22, 
x t minus 1, u 1 t minus 1, u 2 t minus 1 and then x t. Okay, symmetric information, this is symmetric. Okay, so we can now apply, uh, so in this case, it so turns out that they will have exact belief on the entire history because it's a perfect recall, a game with perfect recall and with perfect observation of the state. So now we can apply the principle of dynamic programming. What does that mean? We can solve the game at the final stage first, compute the value functions, plug it into the, uh, to the cost to go function of the stage t minus one and then solve it and continue. So let's write down the recursion, which is V i of capital T, which is a function of i i of capital T, and that's min over u1 capital T of c t. Oh, I haven't written the cost function, right? But the, you remember from our previous discussion, the cost function is Okay, that's the cost function. Of course, what the players try to do is minimize the expected cost, right? Because there is some uncertainty uh, in the system. So CT of X capital T, U1 capital T, and gamma two star or UI T, gamma minus i star so minimize the expected cost of xt u of it and then the strategy of the other player. In fact, there is no expectation here because everything is known. Xt is known, right? That's part of the information set. And then, uh, oh well, we don't know what, we don't know if the second player is going to act according to mixed strategy or not, uh, or a behavioral strategy or not. So there may be uncertainty here because the player is randomizing, the other player is randomizing. Okay, so we, we should still keep the expectation but otherwise, if you see, this part is known because it's equal to this, and this part is known because it's part of the information structure. Okay, so you solve this problem, and you find gamma i star of capital T as the argument of u i t of the same thing. Okay, so that completes the description for the final stage. And then uh, at any other time, C i t of x t u 1 t no u i t gamma minus i star t plus v i t plus 1 okay so that would be my value function so this is known as cost to go cost to go at time t
and an equilibrium that you get from this procedure is known as subgame perfect equilibrium so Subgame perfect means perfect because you have perfect recall, okay, and you are perfectly observing observing the state. So that's perfect part. Subgame because you are solving at every point of time t. You are going to act optimally for all the futures at all the future stages, okay. So your gamma star t is sequentially rational. So gamma star t. I want to write it and the belief is kind of trivial because there is nothing unobserved in this uh, situation except for uh, the condition that the second player or the other player might be using mixed strategy okay so that's the only uh, only uncertainty here so this kind of uh, framework is very useful for attacker defender kind of games because because once you have the model the system model ready and once you have figured out that the information structure is of this type you can directly apply the dynamic programming and find out what the solution is okay uh, this is also useful uh, for instance in the privacy uh, related problems uh, if player 2 wants to get access of the state okay then player 1 can do some sort of randomization in order to confuse player 2 about what the state is at the future time steps okay uh, but of course that will become known to the second player eventually so it may not be very useful but at least at the current time you are trying to preserve your privacy by taking a randomized action okay so that's a uh, this is known as subgame perfect equilibrium. Any question about that? So one th one thing that's quite useful in games of this type is to identify the state. So suppose you started with some state space, and you have this big information structure. It'll be ideal, or it'll be good for you to compress this information and define this game over a more expanded state space uh, so as to make the problem easier to solve or to, so as to make the dynamic programming easier to work with okay uh, i leave it up to you to uh, figure out papers in that area to uh, that identifies uh, an appropriate state space for these class of problems but let me uh, talk about a refinement of subgame perfect equilibrium by the way i want to I want to reiterate, uh, which we had talked about earlier, subgame perfect equilibrium is a refinement of Nash equilibrium. There could be multiple Nash equilibrium, but the one that you can get from backward induction fashion is called subgame perfect equilibrium. Now I am going to talk about a further refinement of subgame perfect equilibrium, which is Markov perfect equilibrium. Okay, but before I go on to that, any question on this model? Okay. So let's talk about Markov strategy. So gamma one, which is a collection of gamma one one, gamma one t is Markov. or Markov uh, strategy if gamma it maps 
एक्स टी टू यू आई टी So what did I do here? So suppose a player is acting according to Markov strategy. What is that player trying to do? The player is ignoring this information, this information, all this information, and only keeping track of this information. Okay, only the current state. So player, player does not. use complete information available to itself okay it's not the same as forgetting okay it's not the same as forgetting that information all he is doing this player is doing is not using all the information to come up with a with an action okay so this kind of restriction makes perfect sense where this information blows up okay so if you have to keep track of a lot of information you might as well say well i cannot compute the equilibrium why not just throw away all the information and just keep the current state just use the current state to come up with an action or come up with a control strategy or come up with an action okay would the dynamic programming still work if i throw away all that information all that useful information so let's see what happens here this becomes a function of xt and i'm going to condition it on xt and vit becomes a function of xt Let's look at that. So given xt, I know what information the other player is going to do, uh, going to uh, use, and so he's going to act according to this. So I can predict what action the other player is going to take, and I know what this variable is exactly. So all I have to do is minimize my own cost, given that the other player is going to act according to Markov strategy. Okay, so this will be a function of xt and xt alone. Now if you think about it from the other player's perspective he's going to argue the same thing well the other player is going to use only markov strategy so he's only going to use xt so i can also throw away all my information and just work with xt because other information becomes irrelevant as soon as one player decides not to use xt uh, not to use the other information information other than xt okay is that is that clear So so the key result here is so right right so if the other person person's action depends only on xt then it's then my best response also depends only on xt and vice versa okay so that you can find an equilibrium purely in markov strategy in which case you don't need to keep track of all that information okay you can throw it away so the result is if pi acts according to markov strategy then or i i shouldn't write pi p minus i acts acts or may be maybe p minus i are multiple players so if p minus i acts according to markov strategy then 
best response of PI can be restricted to Markov strategy. Yes. So if it's more than two players, does all of the other All of them have to, yes. So all the other players have to act according to Markov strategies for best response of PI to be uh, to be in Markov strategy. Okay. So what's the what's the benefit? So think about it. Let's say you are looking at stock market, okay, and you want to do some sort of uh, trading. If all the firms are going to look at the current price of a stock and base their decision on the current price of stock, then it becomes, it, it's in your best interest to also use only that information instead of keeping track of all the information of the previous stock prices and what actions you took and what actions the other person has taken. Okay? So it's really compressing a lot of information and just keeping track of one uh, variable, which is your XT, and that's it. You can you can play the game according to Markov strategy. The other benefit of Markov games is an attacker defender game, which are zero sum games. Okay? So what happens in zero sum game? One of the very nice property of zero sum game is if you have the ordered interchangeability property, okay, which is if you have one strategy, so let's say I, I, I want to write it, write it rigorously. So, so in the specific case of zero sum game, if gamma one star or gamma one star, gamma two star is SPE and gamma tilde one star, gamma tilde two star is another SPE. Then gamma one star, gamma tilde two star is also an SPE, okay? And of course, gamma tilde one star and gamma two star is also an SPE. Okay, so that's ordered interchangeability property of uh, multiple saddle point equilibrium in zero sum games. And Sorry? No. So, so in specifically in zero sum game, let's say player one decides to use all the information, whereas player two decides to use only. So, okay, player one decides to use all the information, and player two decides to use all the information. So that's one saddle point equilibrium. They have to keep track of a lot of information, and player one restricts itself to Markov strategy, and player two restricts itself to Markov strategy. So they have compressed their entire information and just keeping track of one variable. If that's also a SPE, then this is also an SPE, which means player two can restrict himself to Markov strategy, whereas player one can keep track of all the information. However, there's no benefit because the value is the same, right? The value of the game doesn't change which saddle point equilibrium you use. So for zero sum games, especially attacker defender kinds of game, it becomes useful for defender or for attacker to just base his strategy on the current state, okay, and not think about what's happening, what has happened in the past, okay? Can just throw away all that information and can reduce the computational complexity of decision making in that class of problem. So this class of strategy where you restrict 
the players to use only Markov strategy is known as Markov perfect equilibrium and the way to compute Markov perfect equilibrium is to go through this backward induction procedure. Okay, any, any question on that? Yes. Uh, if it's not a zero sum game. Yes. Uh, do, do we still have like a property like this? No. No, you don't have ordered interchangeability property in non-zero sum. That's a special property of two person zero sum game. So even if you have three person zero sum game, the ordered interchangeability property fails. Okay. So it's a, uh, so I should, I should be more careful. I should write two player zero sum dynamic game. Now the question is, let's move back to the original information structure that we started with where players were making noisy observation of the state and they had like a big information history that they were keeping track of. So I'm going to go back to asymmetric information problem. My yi of t equals to hi of t x of t vi of t. And you have player one. Let's say you have two players, player one and player two, and their information is not the same. They are observing different set of information. Uh, the question is, how do we go about solving uh, or, or finding Nash equilibrium in problems of this type? Okay? Or in other words, is there a reasonable restriction that we can impose on this class of games so that we can compute the equilibrium of the game, okay? Perhaps using the backward induction fashion, okay? And if you recall, why did the backward induction fail in this class of problems? Do you remember? Consistent beliefs. Sorry? Consistent beliefs. Consistent belief, right? If you don't know what strategy the other person has used, you can't form a consistent belief on the behavior of the player at the final stage, and so on, right? You go back one step behind. You go back at time t minus one and then you can't form a consistent belief, right? So in some sense, you have to know the strategy of the other player. So th this problem seems, uh, seems difficult to tackle. So let's say we divide the information set into two information. One is common information and the other is private information. Okay. How should we go about uh, forming consistent belief over the other person's information or over the other person's uh, behavior? Okay, that's my next question. So how should they form consistent belief? Suppose I can partition the information into common information and private information. How should they form the belief? In fact, uh, what I want to say is that probability of I pay off relevant variable xt and I minus it given iit is the same as probability over xt p minus it given ct and pit. Okay, 
So this is something that we, we all agree upon because the common information doesn't change in this, these two variables. It's the same thing. So all we need to do is form a belief over the state, the current state, and the private information of the other player given my uh, given the common information and given the private in, given my private information. So what we are going to do now, so this is a difficult problem. This is a difficult game to solve. So what I'm going to do now is lift this game in a higher dimensional space so that it becomes a Markov game. Okay. So the idea, lift this game to a higher dimensional game, so higher dimensional Markov game. And this has connection to partially observable Markov decision problems. Okay, if you haven't heard of it, no worries. So I'm going to formulate a virtual game as follows. Yeah. How do we define the dimensionality of the game? So let's say you started with finite state, finite action, and finite observation sequence. Okay, and it turns out that this higher dimensional game will have compact sets or simplex as its state space. Okay, so that's how you define the higher dimensional game. If you started with a compact sets, then the higher dimensional game will be distributions over compact sets. Okay, which is very high dimension. So let's define a virtual game where the state space or the state evolution equation is pi t plus 1, which is a function of, well, pi t, which is probability of x t, p 1 t, P2T given CT. The action of the players is uh, I need uh, a symbol. Let's say C. CIT that maps PIT to UI. Okay, and I want to focus, I want to focus your attention here. The action is a map. Okay, action is not ui of t, action is ci of t. And ci of t is a map that maps pi of t to ui of t. Okay, so you can think of ci of t in ui of t raised to pi of t. Okay, so it's a you have expanded the action set of the players, depending upon how many private information they have. Okay, and I'm going to make some assumptions on this game, so I'm going to restrict the class of games because in more general setting it's not solvable. Okay, so in order to make sure that we have a clean result, we need to make some assumption on this. So there are two assumptions. Assumption one is CT is a subset of CT plus one, and PIT plus one is a subset of PIT, YIT, and UIT.
okay and then assumption 2 I am going to make is that probability of xt p1t p2t given ct is independent of gamma 1 2 1 to t minus 1. Is the action a function from ti of ttis or state from, is it like from private information or the state? Private information space to the action space. Okay, so this is the script p, this is not the same as this p, even though they look similar. <laughs> okay, this is uh, the space of, space of private information. Okay, same thing here, this is the space of all actions that you have. Okay, so the other assumption, which is the more crucial assumption, is that given common information, the belief over the private information and the state and the, why state because state appears in the cost function okay so the belief over state and the private information is independent of the strategies that the players have used in the past okay and there are many classes of game that satisfy this criteria so to give you an example your ct could be your CT could be Y 1 to 2, 1 to T minus 1, U 1 to 2, 1 to T minus 1 and your PIT could be YIT. Okay. Or you could have a situation where player 2 does not affect the state and player 2 2's information is not part of the common information. Okay? If you want references, I can give you references where these classes of uh, information structures are available. Again, these classes of problems become useful in defender attacker kind of games or in cyber security kind of games. Okay? So Because of this assumption, the fact that the belief given the common information, which is something that both players know exactly. Why? Because common information is common to both the players. Okay? So this belief is known to both the players, this uh, conditional probability distribution. And this conditional probability distribution is independent of the strategies. Therefore, this is something, so this allows players to have consistent beliefs at every point of time when they are making a decision. So I'm now going to define the virtual game where the state equation is pi t plus 1 equals ft pi t c1 of t c2 of t and some random variables. Uh, Actually, I can write it exactly what those random variables are. It's ct plus 1 minus ct. So what is the increment in common information? Okay, Which in turn, the increment in common information, because of the way we have set up the assumption, can be written in, in the form of uh, some exogenous uncertainty and c1 of t and c2 of t and pi of t. Okay. So the belief update equation has a nice Markovian property. Okay. And I'm going to define the cost function C tilde of I T as a function of pi T C I C or C one of T 
and C2 of t as summation Ci of t xt uh, C1 of t P1 of t C2 of t P2 of t multiplied by pi t xt P1, T and P2. Okay. So, this is my state equation. The state space is well defined. It's the set of probability distributions over xt cross p1t cross p2t. So the state space is well defined, the action space is well defined, the cost function is well defined, and it has a Markov property. So pi t plus 1 depends only on pi t, c1 of t, and c2 of t. Okay? These random variables again can be written in terms of these uh, variables. And what other property do we have? Remember that we constructed this virtual game from this original dynamic game. So it turns out, I mean, even though you have to prove, it turns out that the set of Nash equilibrium of this game and this game is preserved. Okay, So it's the same. You have a mapping. You have a bijective map from the set of Nash equilibrium from this game to a set of Nash equilibrium in this game. And so you can, what you can do, remember this is a Markov game. Because this is a Markov game, you can now solve for Markov perfect equilibrium, right? And you can get an equilibrium of this particular game. This is a higher dimensional game. And you can project it back to this game and get an equilibrium of this game. Okay? Is the idea clear? So we solve. So we started with this game. We had this weird problem with the information structure. So we refined the class of games by putting some assumptions. So the first assumption is, well, the common information always has to increase. So no one forgets common information. And the second assumption was, well, private information has to evolve in a certain fashion. And the second assumption, which is a more crucial assumption, is that the conditional probability distribution does not depend on the strategies of the players. Okay, So now we started with this class of games and we have reduced the size of games that we are considering to a small classes of game to a small class of game and then we said well I can transform that original game into this higher dimensional game which is a Markov game. Okay? And since this is a Markov game I can solve to, I can use the backward induction algorithm to find a Markov perfect equilibrium, and let's say, let's say the Markov perfect equilibrium was, let's say my MPE was chi i of star t of pi of t, so that's my Markov perfect equilibrium. A strategy of player i at time t uh, at a specific belief, then I can project it back and get gamma i of t or gamma i star of t of c t and p i t as chi i star of t at pi t, which is a Remember, this is my C i star t. So, so this would be my C i of star t p i t. Okay. So, so this chi i star of t will be. You will plug in the value of the belief at time t into this equilibrium strategy. And then you get Ci star of t, which is a map 
from the private information space to the action space. So you plug in the private information here and you get a solution to the original game. Okay, and this, this technique is also used in Markov decision problems, especially where you don't observe the state. So even if this was a one person decision problem and you did not observe the state, you still have to form this belief and you have to solve this game over the larger state space. That's called POM DP. That's a very well studied field, a very difficult class of problems to solve there and has been used in robotics as well as in autonomous driving and uh, and problems of that type where you don't observe the complete state space. Okay, so POM DP is used and this is the corresponding theory for non-zero sum games. Okay, dynamic non-zero sum games where you don't perfectly observe the state and the information among the players are asymmetric, they are not symmetric. So now you have to start forming beliefs over the private information of the other player. You need to make sure that the beliefs are consistent so by making this assumption, you have gotten rid of that consistency problem. You will always be consistent. And then you can transform it into a dynamic Markov game, solve the dynamic Markov game, project the solution back to the original space, and you get an equilibrium in the original space. OK, any question? OK, so that was, by the way, that was half of my PhD thesis. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, there's really a lot of things to be done uh, in order to prove that this entire technique works. OK, but those are technical proofs, not very important. Uh, but the, the cool thing is this thing works. And you can use this information for many cybersecurity applications where the attacker and the defender may not have the same set of information. Okay? Usually the defender knows more about the system than the attacker. Okay? And in that case, so, so I am the defender. I know more about the system than the attacker. So what attacker has to do is form a belief over my private information and then act in a fashion that it maximizes its own utility. Okay? And increases the cost to the system uh, operator. Of course, one thing that you need, you need to question is this belief. Okay, this may not be true in most of the attacker defender games. So we are still, that theory is still under development. Okay, it's not ready yet. Uh, but I think we, eventually we'll have a theory where we can talk about zero sum games, okay, this is still non-zero sum. We can talk about zero sum game where this assumption can be relaxed, okay. We, we don't want to have, this assumption is fairly natural, you know, there's no problem with this assumption. This assumption is not that natural, okay. We have to keep it for making sure that everyone can form consistent beliefs but it seems somewhat artificial and mathematical, not natural, okay? So we need to work on this part to make sure we can get rid of it, at least for zero-sum games, which is what most of my research topic is all about. Yes? Right. What do you mean? I mean, if there's a, if a state, if you define the state to be the probability of Right, this conditional probability. That depends on previous actions. Strategies. Let's say of t minus n. Right. Then we're still planning. So we can just define the state to be the state. Oh, so, okay, that's a good point. So what happens if it is t minus n or t minus k? Okay, so it's dependent on uh, the strategy, is independent of strategies that have been used way back in the past, but not the recent strategies. What's the problem there? Yeah, there is a problem. 
because then you have to add so you, you see the other strategies would become part of the private information right so the strategy that the player let's say you're looking from player, player one's perspective so the strategy that player two has used from t minus k plus one all the way up to t is the private information of player two okay so now you have to plug it in here and then you have to form the belief over what strategies the other player might have used okay and you blow up the entire problem combinatorially so remember p2 of t might be a smaller space but ci of t is not a small space it's a fairly large space okay so you're going to blow up the the class of uh, blow up the size of the private information set uh, so that this becomes uh, useless okay i mean you cannot solve the problem in theory yes you can solve the problem but in practical you cannot solve the problem okay even with this class of uh, problems the key question that we haven't yet answered uh, is you see keeping track of the value function right so what will the value function look like vi of t would be a function of pi of t right so this is a simplex in certain dimension right so how do you keep track of value functions defined over simplex okay that's a that's a problem because you can't define you can't solve this problem at every point in the simplex because it's a continuous set so you probably have to sample once you sample then you don't know the exact value function at every point in the set so how do you find the strategy at stage t minus 1 and so on and so forth okay so you are going into this approximation algorithms uh, and i don't know what the answer to those class of questions would be so that's another area that you can you can think about and uh, you can come up with uh, approximation methods for value functions well you know approximation methods for value function is something that's already well studied in stochastic control as well as in uh, in um, pom dp literature okay the usual ideas are you use some sort of function approximator you have basis function and you assume that the value function is sum of some coefficients multiplied by basis function so that's one idea the other idea is you sample pi t and then you just come up with Voronoi partition and assume that at each of those Voronoi partition the value is constant okay depending upon the samples uh, the third idea which uh, no one has tried yet is to think of it as a neural network okay so use neural network to approximate this value function I don't know how good that idea is but that's certainly doable because you neural networks are universal function approximators so that's something one can try uh, what else can one try yeah I think these are basis function is the usual approach neural network would be a modern approach uh, and uh, Vonoi partition is somewhat uh, old-fashioned I mean it's useful but kind of old-fashioned any other question okay so in the next class I want to talk about repeated games and the next week I'll talk about algorithms for finding Nash equilibrium in non-zero-sum games